All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think we, uh, what was the start time, 2.35? Is that right? It's, uh, I'm a little late. It's nothing unusual. Uh, so running a scale, you guys have seen this part. Uh, fire exit announcement. I didn't actually get a chance to read it, but I think you've seen it like five times now. Um, so topic here, eyes on target, continuously fielding mission-driven value. Uh, I'm Keith Strini. I'm the Pivotal Federal Practice Lead. Uh, so what that means is uh, PCFS, which is our solutions team, is on the delivery side. So we do a lot of the implementation of custom solutions for our customers um, in the field. And in this particular case, it's a, a little bit different uh, in the federal government, specifically in the national security sector. Uh, I happen to actually come from this background, so I kind of got uh, the designee uh, appointee by Pivotal uh, to be this federal practice lead. Uh, and, and what it was is we really saw this market or vertical sort of opening up and the need to, to help do some transformation and, and not having that, that exact understanding of that context. So um, when we started this, uh, this is a real good quote. Before I came to Pivotal, I actually supported uh, Radham Lewis, and he had this quote about speeding up the delivery of innovation uh, while maintaining technological superiority in order to maximize the warfighter's advantage. And it was something that, it was the first time I had seen it, this was probably mm, three or four years ago, and it was the first time I had seen it sort of caveated this way in which it made total sense about how you switch your mindset from a revenue generated like we do in the commercial sector into what really matters in the, in the defense uh, sector. And so I've sort of carried around this quote everywhere I go. Uh, it's a nice way to, to you know, kind of uh, summarize exactly what we're doing here in this particular uh, vertical. Uh, understanding national security, it's, it's, it's a difficult subject. Um, I know a lot of you, how, how many are actually in the actual field itself in, in supporting DOD? I know like all you guys are. Yeah, so, so you guys all understand, like it's not easy. You know, there's a lot of things that we do that's fundamentally different uh, by necessity and some things that aren't by necessity that are just uh, culture um, that have, have built up over time. And so when we came to this uh, at Pivotal, we were really, um, we, we really wanted to make a conscious effort to translate the shared values that we had on the commercial side into um, things that aligned with the culture that we saw in the DOD and the IC. So, you know, we, we do things with the intelligence community and the Department of Defense and other civilian sectors as well. But this, this talk is primarily focused on the challenges that we have in the defense sector. Um, well, we wanted to do this with a sort of a stubborn intent not to sacrifice um, those things that we, that we enable our co commercial customers to do, but while recognizing there were certain gates uh, uh, that we needed to meet. ATOs, uh, security is different, um, air-gapped environments are different, so there's, that we knew that going into this that there were going to be some things that we needed to shift on, but we wanted to make sure we maintained who we were uh, in this space and make sure that our customer had that same sort of shared vision on, on these different pieces. So the primary goal here was the development and implementation of sort of how could we do continuous fielding uh, and how could we do it well? You know, we knew there were going to be bumps in the beginning, but over time, how would we improve to make this a, a, a very efficient process that, that matched our, our speed in, in the commercial sector? So why go faster? Well, there's different threat domains all over the world, and they're all evolving at different, at, at different speeds. And when you realize that and you think about the different domains that we fight or defend in, you know, you have cyber, electronic warfare, traditional means, these type of things, all of those things have very different, different countries have different evolutions. You know, countries that can't afford, you know, full-blown aircraft carriers and air force, uh, you know, full air forces, they're investing heavily in cyber. So it's still an attack vector. We still have to be aware of it, and we still have to you know, develop capabilities to defend against it. And then you have the traditional, like you, you saw earlier in the talks about uh, projecting air power and, and, and all that goes into those uh, different pieces. And so because of these different speeds, uh, we struggle to stay up with them. I mean, it's, it's basically like fighting on multiple fronts, and we all know that's a bad idea strategically. So when you couple that with the speed, uh, which uh, Captain Kroger had talked about earlier, about how fast things are actually getting to the field, and I think uh, Tori had said something like 11 to 13 years, right? There's no way you can stay up with the, those evolving threats. And so we're opening ourselves up to a lot of these different attacks unless we decide uh, as a group how we want to go faster and without cutting corners. And so that's sort of what I want to talk about today, which is how do we, what, what have we done so far in the space and what, what do we still need to do, but then also recognizing that 
this model is applicable to any of the Department of Defense services, right? This is not specific to Air Force, although there are things that were specific, uh, you know, Intel, we could do certain things, Air Force, we could do certain things, and that will change. Navy's got over the horizon challenges, you know, things like that, but we have plans for doing this type of stuff. It's more about communicating the possibility that this really does apply to the defense sector, rather than just saying this is a commercial thing and, and it would never work in, in, in our particular vertical. Um, but really, this is not, it's not about revenue generation. I mean, we all recognize that, you know, especially folks in this room coming from this field. It's about how to, in the national security space, it's about how fast can you def deliver a compliant solution to satisfy a mission need. And, and, and in the de Department of Defense, you have a, a concept called uh, mission effectiveness. And what that means is, is whether or not a mission got executed. And just to give you an example uh, of something concrete is like the tanker planner situation. Tanker planner, bottom line tanker planner was mission effective. It was refueling all the planes that it needed to do. It didn't mean that each actual individual measure was effective. So where we found savings and were able to save all that fuel cost, that was an efficiency, a measure of efficiency that could be improved. But at the end of the day, they were still fueling all the tankers. And so the idea here is how do you hone in on what those, you know, maintaining mission effectiveness as the bottom line. You know, the, the app cannot go down. The platform must stay up all the time to serve those mission critical components. But then how under the hood are we getting better and better at that? How do we change TTPs to be more efficient? Uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Sorry, I'm jumping to acronyms all the time. Um, but how do we improve those different pieces so that over time we're becoming more and more effective at those missions uh, themselves, more and more efficient at those missions themselves? And so really what we want is we want to figure out how to maintain a certain velocity uh, that we have effective operational agility, and this is gonna give us a continuous advantage over all of our adversaries. And that's really what our ultimate goal is, right? It's not revenue, it's not P&L, those are all awesome, right? We all, as taxpayer dollars, want those different things, but when it really comes down to focusing on the mission, it's how do we maintain that continuous advantage over our adversaries that are, all that are uh, you know, threatening to attack our, our way of life. And so, you always gotta remember why we're delivering, right? So loss, right? You know, we, we're looking at you know better ways to put uh, put folks forward. How to make decisions faster so that it gets them out of harm's way? How do we more effectively drop ordnance on targets to minimize collateral damage and things like that? These are all the different pieces that we're trying to to do at a as as the number one priority, but then still go fast. And a lot of times that's at odds. And so that's what we're sort of learning in this whole. Uh, effort in terms of like Kessel Run, in terms of what we did at NGA, in terms of our other federal clients is how do we, how do we learn from this and, and, and reduce the friction in order to do both, both uh, aspects of this at a minimum. We all know this, right? We, we all have organizational silos. Every single effort that we've done, we, we come across this. In our own organization, we have this. It's something that's always there and we just learn to get better. And so you heard a little bit about this earlier, so it's kind of nice because I don't have to go through all the stuff because Captain Kruger and, and Tori did a really good job of articulating you know, smaller deliveries, faster deliveries, less risk, eliminate that stuff. So I don't know if you guys have seen the sawtooth versus the exponential, things like that. I mean, that's really what we're after here is, is how do we reduce risk through the deployments. DIY platforms, you heard a little bit earlier, without a unified fielding approach, this is what you get. You know, everybody goes off and builds their own, and then you have to come up with adapters for every single, you know, different standard. This is what we're trying to eliminate, where, you know, is, is, is the system of systems architecture that's so complicated, it requires a large sustainment tail. It requires a lot of troubleshooting, and whole organizations stood up to support it. This is what we're trying to get through and, and, and be more, uh, be more, I don't want to use agile, but be, be more nimble in the way we actually approach these different integration points. Because this is what we want to get to. You know, this is really the key, right? The, the, the faster you can get feedback from, from the warfighter, the more the applications resonate, the better the intuitiveness of the actual application is, so that then they can eff effectively do their missions. And then even start thinking outside the box. With this extra time that I've got because it became more efficient, I can now think of better ways to do those uh, techniques, tactics and procedures in order to be more efficient in my mission. And it becomes like a, uh, a, a cycle that, that's good, but we'll get to that later. Um, Non-functional requirements. Uh, I'm sure you guys are all aware, non-functional requirements tend to, tend to be the first thing scrapped when budget cuts come. 
It's like, hey, it's out there, it's good, it breaks, hey, we'll support it, get it back up and running. But it's not, it's things that, you know, if you're proactive about it, we can get it much more stable. We can get that ahead of the curve in the beginning. We can address more things on the non-functional side. And it doesn't have to be an extra effort and the first thing cut when budgets come. It can be part of the integrated process, which a lot of, you know, we do some of that with the TDD, the, sorry, the test-driven development sort of focus. Uh, and we do, uh, do a lot more uh, quality uh, types of coding and things like that. But there's even more processes that can be put in place with uh, automated pipelines graduating through environments and going through maturation gateways like canary testing, like um, load testing, chaos testing, uh, resiliency exercises to prove that the designs are valid and that they'll hold up under the adverse conditions downrange uh, in the field. Um, the two most important factors, performance and testing. These are often overlooked, um, and, and like I said, they're, they're, they're the things that require the most care and feeding in the beginning, but then once they're built into the DNA of the applications going forward, we're able to actually carry that all the way through, through, through to uh, better stability out in the, in the edge. And you heard a little bit about this earlier too, functionally acceptable is no longer acceptable. So a lot of this, um, you know, we go in and, and we start talking about culture and cultural changes. These things are really important to understand because you know, the way business has been traditionally done, it has been, you know, here's the requirement. Did you meet it? Yes, check. It's, there's no qu uh, qualitative aspect to it. It's, it's we've done the bare minimum, uh, and that's no longer good enough. Uh, you heard Captain Kroger say earlier about being, building joyful software. And it's really, I mean, that, that's definitely part of it, like the user, the, the joy of the user. But there's also a whole nother, you know, under the iceberg uh, uh, type of, of aspect, which is, you know, if I can go in and I can pull the plug on a rack and we've designed the applications the, in a, uh, with the idea that it's a mission critical application and pulling the plug on that rack will not uh, cause any outages in the mission capability. Those are the type of things that we want to build up to in the resiliency in the, the mission critical space. And this is fundamentally different. Yeah, I get the commercial likes that too. But it's less likely to happen in commercial. You'll have outages and you'll have these kind of things. When you have the threat of actually being under fire and being able to do disaster recovery and shifting sites and conducting mission operations on the next heartbeat, that's the type of things that we need to build into the DNA of, this, of the quality of the stuff going forward. So these elements uh, are critical in fielding every delivery and sustainment of every capability uh, going forward. Because like I said, we want to get to this. The only way we build trust with the warfighter is when they know that when it gets put out in operations, it's not going to go down. They can't trust that if, you know, I have a you know, sexy new feature that I asked for and it's there, but then it disappears on me midway through and I've got to revert back to the old way of doing business, that's a problem. And then as that erodes the trust, then it becomes more and more difficult to, to solicit feedback from them to build better, uh, more res uh, resonant apps. And, and, and do this kind of stuff. So to get back to that cycle where they're providing us feedback, we're building better software, they provide us more feedback, and we're getting more and more effective missions, this is the type of thing that has to be built into the DNA of this. You know, because we want to focus on code, right? Platform is always treated as an afterthought, and I'm a platform guy, so it's fine. I can say those type of things, but that's what you want, right? The, the, the ultimate testament of success is when I plant the flag and say nobody notices me in the room. All right? I mean, that's ultimately what we want to get to. We want to get it to where you're not even thinking about that. But that doesn't mean that we can cut corners, right? Because safe software is difficult. I mean, don't let anybody fool you. I, I know we love to soundbite a lot of different things uh, from all different levels. But at the end of the day, safe software is tough. It is tough. It requires a lot of thought and how this stuff is deployed. It requires a, a good understanding of the characteristics of the objectives of the application itself. It, it requires, you know, understanding the environment that the platform is going into, that the app is going into, and the types of missions that would be conducted on, on top of it. And so these things, when you kind of find that empathy with the platform teams and the application teams, you start realizing what is actually important in the delivery. And it starts helping you set the priorities on feature development. It starts helping you set the priorities on platform evolution and things that you want to do in this, in this, particular, um, in this particular vertical. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is what a DIY platform looks like. You know, like this is what you want to get away from because you're not in the business of building a platform in the de defense department. You're in the business of actually conducting mission operations. And so, you know, this is, why you, this is why you come to like sort of a unified platform strategy. It's because it offloads a lot of these different things from you and, and having to learn all these different skill sets and then have, keeping track of all the different evolutions of all those different technologies, licensing, supportability, those different types of things. And so once you kind of take this and look at the unified strategy and you kind of take that off the plate, now you can focus on organizing around the mission. 
and this is really what you want. Yeah, it's crown, it's my cartoon, so it's, it's fine. I don't really have a graphic for it, but, but these are all the different elements that go into the application. Like if you think about this in this, in this particular vertical, you know, user experience, Warfighter owning the product and providing that feedback, you know, government sponsors, you know, and a lot of you guys are, are those folks you know, in the room. It's how do you organize around the mission so that instead of having these vertical uh, silos, we can get more into a horizontal flow and out to the field faster and faster. And so that's really why we do this organization around the mission. Because we want, remember, we, we want to do this, right? This is what we're trying to build up to, up to, but we can't cut corners. There's no workaround for IA. There isn't. Like, as much as IA has always been that long pole in the tent and we're starting to conquer it, we're starting to get through that. You know, you heard earlier about the shared application controls that are inherited all the way up from infrastructure all the way up through the platform, and now you're only dealing with 40 some odd controls. We did not shortcut that. We knew we wanted to go fast, but we did not shortcut the process because ultimately it, it then opens us up to vulnerability, right? And that's what we do not want. At the end of the day, we want to be reliable and we want to be secure. And then from there, the sexiness comes with all the different features. Um, continuous patching is part of that piece, you know, uh, introducing that uh, whole different concept and idea, which was like, oh my God, like you guys can patch like all the time and you, it's, there's no end of life. There's no EOL problems like we had in the, in, in the past where you're still sitting on Windows 98 because we can't get a new operating system out there. We can keep the operating systems up to date across the entire portfolio. From the VM level all the way up through the application, we can continuously patch that. And you know, in working with those uh, MOAs and understanding how those things are gonna roll out and how we still maintain the stability of patching all the time, but being able to canary style those things out and see if they're gonna crash and burn and if we need to go back to the drawing board and provide another patch, or or everything is good and roll it across the entire platform and in you know four to six hours your entire piece is all up to date which then becomes a moving target for any of our any of our adversaries to attack uh, you know I'm sure some of you guys have probably heard our, our repaving uh, story and things like that you know creating a small moving target is a lot harder to hit and then you combine that with all the uh, in-depth layer of security and, and stuff that we put around the platform and networks and now you have a, a, a very resilient system but also a very secure system in order to move forward uh, with mission critical pieces and we also are able to then offload uh, resources to the experts so things like a unified security model I don't know, you guys ever remember working in the past about how we had to do security before? Every app had to bring their own security. And then every time there was a change or there was a vulnerability, you had to go through and figure out who was using which security model and how that stuff would work. Identity access was the same way. And it became very problematic to do any kind of updates and it always required long lead times and, and RE events and, and you know all these different pieces just to patch or just to update or just to upgrade some aspect of identity management security. And you had to do it because if you left it then, it, then you have a vulnerability in there. And sometimes those vulnerabilities would sit there for three years. You know? and, and, and so what you do here is you say, okay, we have a, a security team and they will run that piece and we will integrate with that security. And then that shared security model will then move down across all the applications within the platform and in the entire portfolio. And you know what? The developer doesn't even need to know about it. They say, bind to my SSO app and I get past a resource token. And I know what to do with that resource token because it's talking about roles that I need to develop in my application and I know what those mean. But I don't know what that PKI stuff is. I don't know what all is. You know what? You don't have to worry about that. That's all gone, right? There's a team that's handling that. We've integrated with that team and now everybody that rolls across the platform can just deal with the actual application pushes. Runtime, same kind of thing. How do we verify what's in runtime? How do we know we don't have an advanced persistent threat that is burrowed into our stuff? We don't care because we pave that stuff. You know, you set your policy guidelines, we can pave through containers, we can pave through VMs, we can pave through entire architectures to make sure that if there is something, all the time that they spent trying to penetrate and get in there, suddenly they just got wiped and they got to start all over again. And so pretty soon they'll give up, you know what I mean? If they even get through in the first place. And so the idea is we can even verify at runtime the types of things that are out there and making sure that these things stay, uh, stay stable. Continuous feeling, what is it? Right, that's, that's a culmination of all these different pieces, the resultant uh, outcomes that produce tangential benefits from the fiscal responsibility that, uh, that Tori talked about through the mission applications and, and, and how we continually provide actual capabilities but without sacrificing anything in the meantime. So now we're ready to talk about this, right? So you heard a little bit about the, you know, what we call our UCD or user-centric design process. And you know, the, biggest, the biggest benefits to this is, um, I think if you, 
if you went out and you talked to our users that have gone through this process, uh, be it labs or AppTX stuff, or, or just now as, as the Air Force and NGA stand up their own organizations to do this, I think what you find, uh, which is often a understated benefit, is that there are no tech manuals. There aren't a need for tech manuals, right? They're very lightweight. Why? Because they told us exactly how you would want to use the application. And so this is the epiphany, right? The idea is that if you tell us how to use it, we don't have to provide a tech manual for it. I mean, we, we're going to provide release notes and things about it, but we don't have to provide these big giant tech notes and then it doesn't make sense how they're using it. It's all becoming intuitive, which means, what does that mean? It means that we actually look at how do we train techniques, tactics, and procedures instead of worrying about in the tech manual how to pull down a drop-down box, how to change my font size, how to do these different pieces that have nothing to do with my job, nothing to do with the mission that I'm executing. It, it, it's all stuff that is, it's, it's just been there and I've always had to deal with it before. The other thing that we do is realistic data, right? It's this idea that, you know, you can't mock up the kind of stuff that we see. This could be something as simple as, you know, real, you know, Link 16 stuff or USMTF messages or formats that come over and not realizing that they can go beyond a certain character that we thought was there, right? That then suddenly mangles displays on the, on the screen. It's, it's from that level of detail all the way up to, you know, the size and scale, like tanker planner and how many tankers are in theater, how many, how many planes are they trying to refuel, how many targets are we talking about here, global operations, what does that actually look like and how many things do we have to keep track of and, and do this type of thing. Using realistic data gave us some new insight into, uh, you know, the mocks don't always do what we need them to do. And so there needs to be a realistic testing environment in order to make sure that when it goes out into operations, it's going to perform as expected. And again, the ultimate goal, training time shifts from tools to mission function. I mean, there's no better thing than that, right? Like the idea that now I'm doing my job and that's the only thing I'm doing. I'm not doing all these other things that I have to do in order just to get to being able to execute my, my particular job. And that's the intuitiveness of the user-centric design and how that payoff works at the end of this. And then, you know, never settling for less than direct feedback from our users. And this is a big thing, right? This is, you know, in the past, and, and this is not a, a knock on anybody, it's just how the organizations worked. You had a requirements office, and you heard about you, you heard what Tori has said before. You have a requirements office that gets a requirement, and it vets it for three years. Then it goes through an acquisition process that tacks on another piece. And the thing is, is what that requirement was is not what it is today in the mission space. And so by not eliciting feedback directly from the actual warfighter, then you don't know if the actual mission requirement is still valid. And so the same way you can save money, like creating a, a more efficient tanker planner, you also save a whole bunch of money on requirements that you can sunset, that you never even started building. Because there's a implied debt that's sitting out there. You know, all my unsatisfied requirements all add up to some dollar amount. And if, if I'm just getting chunks of money from Congress to just execute against those requirements, and 80% of them are no longer valid because they're stale, I just saved whatever 80% of that budget was, right? So there's, there's also this addition by subtraction uh, that, you, that you get by having this direct feedback from the user. So there's the cost of delay, and, there, and then there's the cost of like implementing the wrong thing. And, and that's the other thing that we get or we, we minimize when we have this direct user feedback. And then quality, right? We don't want to sacrifice. Developers and testers are not a different function. This is the new way of doing software, right? There's no test organization doing manual checklist anymore. And then that goes into a black hole and then you provide feedback and you don't understand the context. You don't understand you know, how, they, how they actually ran the test. They, it, the, the feedback is maybe not useful. Or you're, by the time you got that feedback, you're already three releases forward and you already discovered some of these problems, so you wasted manpower. So the idea here is that when you switch to more of a test-driven development model, your developers are the testers and the testers are developers, which means that if you think about this from a DOD perspective with test organizations, you have a whole bunch of billets sitting out there. I know this is controversial, but you'll have a whole bunch of coders that are sitting out there when you start thinking, rethinking about the test, -driven the test organizations and making them into TDD coders. And so that's a huge uh, set of billets that are outstanding that you could actually start converting and make them part of the fight and, and being able to, to deliver these capabilities forward. It's all about the journey, right? So we do journey testing, you know, in, in uh, mimicking user base, uh, how they do operations, these type of things. Quality, encoding is an art form. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys uh, give you a chance to read the cartoons, but, but this is what you see all the time in the past, right? 
this is the idea, is you have, a, you have a quality assurance organization that's separate from your actual coders, that's separate from your actual testers. And so what ends up happening is you get these type of things where it's like nobody understands what the actual code did. The QA folks don't understand what it's there for. They can't really articulate why it shouldn't be there. You've got uh, coders that you know, built something that they think they understand what the requirement is, but then it doesn't function in a production sort of setting. And so you have all different kinds of disconnects between these organizations, which is another reason why we, we organize around the mission and, and, and do this. And then this was a big challenge, uh, specifically with the Air Force. We didn't have as much in the uh, NGA part, but overcoming that transient workforce, right? <laughs> transient being loosely used here. Right, and so the idea here is that, you know, it was something that was just, it actually just happened to be a, a side benefit, right? Because we do pairing, uh, because we do pairing, it really illustrated the strength of pairing that you don't normally get to see in an everyday, in, in a commercial setting, is the idea is like, if you have people shipping out every six months, you know, if you worked anywhere else that did not do pairing, all that context would be lost and you'd be constantly on resetting. But not only did the Air Force survive, they ended up thriving on that pairing model such that there was, you know, people would come and go, guest appearances, people would come and go in six months, people would come and go in a year, and they were still able to maintain that consistent context across the entire effort. And that's a testament to the pairing model working and then the Air Force fully understanding the power of that pairing model and how to apply it to their, the, the adversity that they were experiencing with, those, with that particular workforce. And then, of course, the most difficult part, right, velocity to the edge. A lot of great ideas end up on the shelf. They get through developments, they get maybe through QA, sometimes die in testing, sometimes die in exercises. It's really getting over that last hurdle to get it out to the field, and that's where we focused on first, was what would it take to get it, how do we start at the field, how do we build the pipelines back so that we could turn, like the moment we can get one drop means the moment I can turn the faucet on full blast and get capabilities delivered out to the field. And so that's really what we, what we were looking at, is how do we overcome the most difficult part, the velocity to the edge piece? And then why? why? So here's a whole other benefit to why we do this and why we offload to the platform, the invisible hand of the market. So how many, how many Silicon Valley efforts do we have around the country now? Boston's a hub, Silicon Valley's a hub. You know, you, here's tech, tech solutions popping up all over. But the reason why those things aren't getting into the government is because what you have is you have this barrier to entry. You either have to be a defense contractor, you have to understand the FAR clauses, you have to understand all these different pieces. So two kids in a garage shop that are brilliant at building pathing algorithms will never get that in front of the warfighter in the past. But now with this and offloading all of these different elements of how to graduate code into production and into operations, how to offload the security, the identity pieces, they just have to focus on what they do well. And what this does is it lowers the total cost of ownership of capability development. It means that if this isn't performing well, some big defense contractor over here, five layers of management, it's costing me this much money, and I can do a fly-off with a, a you know, two-person two shop, and that actual algorithm is just as effective, but yet the cost is super low because they don't have that, and this is going to scare big defense contractors. Sorry, Johnny. Uh, anyway, so like the idea here is that you know, when, you, when you look at that, that is what we want as taxpayers. We want the best ability, the base, best capabilities going out to the field to support our warfighter. But all those slides that I showed before about not sacrificing anything, that's what we have to maintain. So this is a perfect model for that because by offloading it to the platform, you've done that, right? You've already ensured the maturity is going to be there by the time it graduates into operations, but now you're able to source five different pathing algorithms, have them fly off, which one won, which one was the most value based on its cost. And then the support and sustainment pieces come through because why? If I want them to continue to use my pathing algorithm, I better keep updating it, right? Because the next one's right behind me and now I've got a competition for it. So it's awesome, right? It creates this whole invisible hand in the defense sector, which has been kind of non-existent since the 60s, right? Because the, you know, the big defense contractors kind of boxed everybody out and this is the gateway and everything became so complicated to get in and now we've eliminated that. And so this is an exciting new time, pioneering. People can set up two, four person shops and, and, and build businesses and have a nice little business being service marketplace inside of Cloud Foundry and these type of things and they can continue to sustain and maintain this. And what this means is simplifying delivery means deliver, the overall TCO goes down, total cost of ownership. And that's gonna be, pay huge dividends in the long run for us as U.S. citizens and taxpayers in the Department of Defense. And so ultimately, what we learned from this is that this model works, right? I, have you guys heard the, the phrase watching the vapor trail? 
So this is where a spotter is looking because you know snipers are shooting so far you can't actually see the the, the ordnance on uh, the, the rounds on target. So this is making those micro adjustments here and there until we can actually hit on target every single shot. And that's really what we're trying to do here is continually to learn and continually to evolve, but make sure that we're constantly give, giving that micro uh, adjustment so that we're always uh, trying to get those shots on target. And that's it. Any Q and A?